All right, cool. Well, why don't I go through kind of what we're going to talk about today and kind of what we're going to cover in this next half hour. So we are going to be um, starting with uh, what is social media and kind of looking at those words. We're going to talk about know, like, and trust and how that plays into social media. Then we're going to cover kind of an overall strategy for social media, talking about your ideal client. So a lot of this kind of back end stuff before you ever consider what social media platforms to be on and any of the actual strategy, we want to like everything we do know the why behind it. Then we're going to talk about what you need to do in social media, but even more importantly, what you need to not be doing in social media. And then we're going to talk about specifics today of Facebook and then tomorrow and Thursday, we're also going to be covering, covering Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn um, and have maybe a little bit of time for questions. But even if you have questions, you can always drop that into the Facebook group. Uh, we're going to dive into the content and then have a little bit of time for questions, but we have all the Q and A's throughout the month as well. And we're active in the Facebook group. So I wanted to start with just talking about this word social media. Now, when we think of just the word social, in the chat area, put what you think uh, when you just think the word social. Um, for me, I think about hanging out with friends and family. Like this weekend, we went camping with a couple families, hung out on the beach and played spike ball, played in the water. To me, that's socializing. Uh, so what do you think of when I say the word social? Drop that into chat. Or if you're watching this recording, and just think for a second, when you just hear the word social, like, hey, let's be social, what do you think of? And then when you think of the word media, what comes to mind? Uh, for me, it's kind of like this one-sided relationship. I think billboards, I think um, people putting out content in the newspaper, radio, kind of that traditional media. And, and so if we pull apart social media, it's the combination of these two things, of socialization, connections, and media. And oftentimes in private practice, what we do is we think about social media like the media side. How can we get people to come into our practice? How do we get people to listen to my podcast? How do we get people to do something they really don't want to do? Uh, in the same way that a billboard you know, is selling something like a granola bar and it uses all these sexy people to show you, hey, if you eat this granola bar, you're going to be sexy. That's how we often approach social media. And, and that's not looking at the other side of the coin, where it's the social side, it's the culture side, it's jumping into the party. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk talks a lot about social media. He's, he's written a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. And he uses the analogy of each social media platform being like a party. And so when you walk into a party, you don't just start throwing out your business cards. You don't just start telling everybody how great you are. You get to know the party. You connect with people, you talk with people. And so the same sort of thing as we talk about social media, we start with this is social. People are on there to look at pictures of their grandkids. They're on there to look at an infographic on Pinterest. They're on there to see what the president just tweeted. They're on there for different reasons. Uh, and we wanna jump into that party rather than disrupt that party. So at its core, we don't wanna disrupt the party. We wanna make sure we understand that kind of area and what we're doing there. So another principle I wanna chat about is the idea of know, like, and trust. Zig Ziglar is one of the, the greatest kind of business teachers of all time. Uh, in a sense, he was the first one to do something like a podcast where he had these little, um, they, were, they were just cassettes that you could buy and he called it, uh, I think it was like Automobile University. And the idea was that when you're stuck in your commute, actually learn something during that time about your business rather than just be stuck listening to music. And so he was one of the first people who was teaching business principles while people were stuck in a commute driving to work. So Zig Ziglar talks a lot about know, like, and trust. That really what you're taking people through is this process of first, they don't know you exist, and then they know you exist. And then they like you, and then they trust you. So I think back about uh, my wife, Christina, when I was in high school, when I was a senior in high school, she was a junior. My friend Phil said, hey, I know this girl who can get us cheap snowboarding tickets and she'll drive us out to the snowboarding hill. And so Christina, she could get us these cheap tickets because it was through a school she had gone to when she was younger. And so all of, there's tons of women in the world that don't even know I exist. Now this Christina, she knows I exist. So she knows me. Then there's even fewer women that like me. So then I end up weeding people out and she weeds people out. We go off to college and reconnect and then we end up trusting each other and getting married. Now that's true with our businesses too. It's just as important to say who's in as it is to say who's out. The way that you define your brand, the way that you talk on social media, the way that you talk on your website, all of that points to who's in, but even more importantly, who's out. So if you do EMDR, for example, with people that are dealing with trauma and people that are dealing with all sorts of things that have gone on in their life. 
Well, that also means that you don't serve a certain population. Maybe you don't serve girls that are cutting and maybe you don't serve angry boys uh, and maybe you don't help couples. Maybe you just help individuals that have been through sexual violence. So knowing who's in and knowing who's out is part of you clarifying how you talk on social media. And if you don't do that work ahead of time of who your ideal client is and who you're trying to attract, then you're gonna just say, oh, I need to be on everything and then nothing's gonna work. All right, so one of the first things we wanna look at is your overall strategy and how it relates to your ideal client. And, and Sam, I'm sure you have some ideas as well on how to attract an ideal client. And I'm gonna give you a chance to chat a little bit about that in just a minute. But we wanna just start with uh, who are we trying to attract? Who is the decision maker in the relationship? So for example, if you're gonna work with teens, is it teens that are reaching out for therapy or is it usually their mom or their dad? You know, if you're working with co-parenting, is it usually the mom or the dad in that situation? Uh, and so really looking at not only who are you trying to attract, but is there someone that's the decision maker in the relationship that picks up the phone or sends you an email or automatically schedules through your EMR on your website? And so thinking through that, and then how does that person make decisions? And so that's gonna lead us to a number of different social media platforms. So we may wanna have some bedrock, you know, Instagram things that are there, but that's more because we're working with, you know, college students, or we're working with people that are more visual. Maybe we work with designers and we help them, you know, through counseling. So thinking through those specific areas and the specific social medias. Now, I would say Facebook is almost, it's as essential as a website at this point. You have some sort of presence and some sort of, you know, a couple times a week posts that you schedule out. And we'll go into some of that strategy. To me, that's where the majority of people are, at least on Facebook. And so you'll want to at least have some Facebook presence. So in regards to ideal clients, Sam, um, what are some, some thoughts or observations you've had with working with so many different clinicians? Yeah, so I think um, one of the most important things when it comes to Facebook and reaching your ideal client is to add value. So I've kind of broken it down into for every five posts, make sure that three are adding value. So whether it be tips um, or a link to a blog post or an inspirational quote, so three out of the five should add direct value to the ideal client. And then I would say one to showcase a bit of your personality, because as you were saying in the beginning, social media is a great way to interact with people. So um, not just kind of showing them your brand, but showing them a bit of who you are. And then um, having one be promotional about your services. So we don't want to use social media just to promote your services the whole time and try and get people to book an appointment with you because they're going to see that as promotional. Um, but I think as you said in the beginning, kind of connecting with them by adding value. So having three out of the five posts add value, um, one showcasing your personality and one promoting your services. I love that breakdown because oftentimes I think people, they know what to do when it comes to promoting, but they don't, they feel like it's kind of slimy. And I think that sliminess happens when people aren't providing value. And so uh, that, that idea of having some tips. And so um, let's just take the example of maybe someone that works with teenagers. And so if we think through, okay, it's August, a lot of teens are going back to school. Uh, what would be some tips, Sam, that you would say um, would fit in those three posts that are providing value? What, what comes to mind for you? Um, well, funny enough, I actually just helped um, a client design posts for um, children specifically. So um, some of her tips were how to get back into the back to school routine. Um, so you could kind of just research that and just grab um, a few tips from the web on, you know, reinforcing bedtimes or, um, you know, like meal times, things like that, getting back into the swing of things. Um, so, yeah, you could basically just, just anything that's kind of relevant to your ideal client when it comes to um, tips and advice, any tips and advice that you give in consulting sessions, you could just grab that and put that on a post. Um, obviously that adds a lot of value to people on your Facebook page. Yeah, and I think that even just thinking, well, what are people likely to share? Uh, when I think about having a four-year-old and a seven-year-old and putting together lunches, you know, three to five days a week for them, that doesn't have to necessarily do any, have anything to do with counseling, but it does because, you know, if I'm less stressed as a parent, if I feel like, okay, if I get a big package from Costco of the squeezies and granola bars and kind of plan out their meals for the week and then have most of that prepped on Sunday, I'm going to probably be more present every morning when I don't feel like getting out of bed. And 
you know, even doing little things like getting the coffee ready the night before, maybe that's going to help me be a better parent in the morning. And so those little things oftentimes we think, well, that's not really counseling, but it is because if you're focusing on, you know, parents of young kids like myself, uh, those are things that I am on social media already for. You think about all the videos that you watch or you share or you say, oh, you know, to your friends, you tag them and say, you've got to check this out or you share it with them. It's not somebody's promotion. It's usually these tips or these hacks. You're like, I never thought of that. How cool that you can get that stain out with that thing. Uh, those are things that if we say, okay, I'm a counselor for families, but then what's all the family life stuff that I'm going to work on and share? Those are great tips that you can do. Um, I'd say also even just going on to, you know, Huffington Post, looking at the lifestyle section, you can find a bunch of great articles that you just share other people's articles if you don't have the content. Now, what about Sam? You said spotlighting your personality. What does that look like? I know a lot of therapists, they kind of say to themselves, I don't want to reveal too much about my life. Uh, you know, I'm worried about that. What would you suggest are things that you would put in the uh, appropriate or needed side and things that you would say, oh, that might be oversharing too much? Um, so yeah, funny enough, I was also actually chatting with a client who loves cats. Um, so she wants to showcase that on her Facebook page. So um, she likes to post a bunch of cat memes. Um, so I would say that's appropriate. I mean, you know, people love memes. They love anything that's um, humorous or funny. They'll share that. Um, but I would say, again, like kind of keep it within the ratio that I mentioned earlier earlier. So um, don't kind of overload the page with cat memes and not a lot of added value for the client, like just keep it within that ratio. And um, things that I would say is not appropriate on your business page would kind of be, I would say just kind of think, um, you know, what you share on your personal page. So I would say um, kind of, well, you could include photos of what you've, what you're doing, but you know, like photos of your kids or um, your food, um, things that you share on your personal page, I would say keep that off of your business page because um, ultimately people aren't really interested in that. They're following you for your expertise. So as much as you want to showcase your personality, don't take it overboard with too much of your private life. I mean, I'd say rather than posting photos of yourself, um, post things that you're interested in. So maybe an activity you did on the weekend or as I said, cat memes, um, just things like that. No, I think that's a great point. And you know, when you said cat memes, I right, right away thought like, <laughs> oh no, is this therapist going to be like a crazy cat lady? But then it's like, if you follow that one to five ratio, then yeah. you should be having all this other stuff. And so it's kind of peppered in there uh, yeah. versus, you know, that it's all cat memes and everything. And, and maybe that's what they want. Maybe they have therapy cats or something. <laughs> and, and it's like, th that's who they want to attract. And so they're going to, you know, weed me out because I'm more on the dog side, even though, cat, you know, Sam's more on the cat side. <laughs> so, um, so then what about the direct pitching? How do you, how do you do something that's a call to action that doesn't feel slimy? Cause I think that's one of the biggest questions I get, not just in next level practice, but even with next level mastermind and slowdown school, People just don't want to be slimy. Um, and real quick, in the chat, if you have follow-up questions, we'll weave those into this conversation. I see some questions came in, and I'll be monitoring that, Sam, so you don't have to jump in there. Uh, but you know, how do people do a call to action that doesn't feel slimy that actually gets people in the door for counseling? I'd say keep it as simple as possible, and um, but make the call to action as impactful as possible so that if people want to know more, they can click through to your website. I think it becomes kind of slimy as you would say if you're trying to um put in too much information within your facebook post so i think um kind of the best way to do it is to mention your offering or your service um kind of in a simple post with a really nice clean impactful graphic and then just say you know click here for more information if people are interested they'll click through um, but if they're not they can kind of just scroll past and they don't feel like you've pitched them too heavy with whatever your service offering is well, I think even just how you've been speaking is a great example of that. It's, it's natural for you to say, well, when I was working with this client on this area, you know, those that are here may not know that you work directly with clients. Our goal for this isn't to sell you, but you're then just saying, you know, when I work with, with counselors, when I help them with their social media, here's what happens. And we can kind of use that same sort of thing where we might say, one thing I've noticed with families that I work with, without revealing obviously confidential or sensitive information, is that most families have these questions, boom, 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 boom. Uh, we often cover this by addressing it through these tips. 
Uh, if you're interested in talking to a therapist at Mental Wellness Counseling, here's our phone number or contact us here. That then becomes sort of that content is part of it. And then it's not just trying to get someone to make a decision that they wouldn't otherwise make. Uh, yeah. The other side of slimy that I would say I see is when, when it feels like you're trying to get someone to make a decision based on um, just like fear or like this could happen. Like, mm -hmm. do you want your kid to end up in prison? Of course not. Like, and, and that's kind of an extreme example. But you can find smaller versions of that too, that when you're really basing most of your content on fear, not on the reality, um, that's when I think that we tend to lose people. Um, you can do that in a way though that is accurately sharing statistics and then people realize that there's you know, an opioid crisis or that most kids are not sleeping enough. And that's not fear, that's just informative. I see a few uh, questions coming in. Sam, how do you feel about um, focusing on two different ideal clients? Um, on social media, let's say. Yeah, I would say rather kind of um, become successful in engaging with the one. Um, I would say focus on one first. I think it's always better to kind of simplify things and um, become an expert at engaging with that one ideal client. And then I think once you feel like you're able to connect with that ideal client successfully and you actually feel like um, you're getting that specific ideal client through your Facebook posts, um, then I would say you can maybe move on to another one. But I think um, the more targeted your posting is, um, the better and the more engagement and the more response you'll get from it. Yeah, and I think that what I've seen successful clinicians do with their practices is maybe they start helping angry kids, but then they also add frustrated parents. And so it's, it's connected, but not the exact same. And so kind of saying, well, what's the DNA of my practice here? And so maybe it's, you know, we do more family work and then we're going to do mom Monday and we're going to do like tantrum Tuesday and having kind of a theme for each of the days of the week as you grow your yeah. specialties. Um, but they're all somehow connected. I mean, if you're all over the place where you do EMDR with people with trauma, you also help people that are doing eating disorders and couples and depression and anxiety, you're really not going to be known for, for a specific area and you'll just be seen as a generalist and not be able to charge as much and also not attract as many people. Um, a couple of other questions that are coming in that I think relate to where we're at with this is, um, Angela asks, Sam, I noticed you gave advice before in an older Facebook video to, for folks not to share other people's posts on your Facebook. Uh, if it provides value to your ideal client, then isn't it good to share? So I think that's a great question from Angela. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I have some thoughts as well. Yeah. Um, so I would say, yeah, I mean, if it is valuable um, and it's from like a credible source, then you are, you can share it on your, your page. Um, but I would just want to limit this because ideally you want the funnel to be from your Facebook page to your website, um, promoting your services. So I would say um, if you find it to be very valuable and you have the time, then I would say redo it on your website and add your um, opinion to it. So if it's like a blog post, um, then I would say take the thoughts that they mentioned in their blog post, rewrite it, but add your thoughts to it as well. And then it can be something that you post on your Facebook page and people link back to your website. So ideally you always want them to be linking back to your website. You don't want them to come to your Facebook page, but then send them somewhere else. Yeah. And I, I think that there are those reputable sources. So it might be a Huffington Post article yeah. or I think videos, it's hard to produce a bunch of amazing videos. So if yeah. you find some great parenting videos or ones that are on depression or happiness, sharing those, but then to in the comments, rather than just share it, maybe put something like, you know, mental wellness counseling, we help so many people around feeling happier. This is such a great example of people finding happiness through having cats and dogs or through rescuing pets or whatever the video is. So then you're tying it back to your brand as well. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Jamila asks, uh, could a link to a blog post be a promotional or call to action? Uh, I, I would say that it could be both. So if you pull parts of the blog post and actually put it within the social media where you say, here's the five tips that we give around getting back on a good schedule for sleep when you're starting school back up for elementary students. Uh, and here's the full blog post. It could be really helpful within it. Um, so kind of the question you want to ask yourself for the three out of five that Sam's talking about is if someone just read that, could they leave and get something away from that with, without ever clicking on something that would be more on the content side. That's adding value that it's just, it's great on Facebook. I could never leave Facebook and be totally fine. 
when we're saying a call to action, we want to say, okay, they have to do something. That's the action call to action. We want them to click on the blog post to help them build that trust or to build that likability. And so if we're taking them through that, no, well, do they know that we exist? Well, the more that you're on social media, you know, occasionally boosting posts here and there, but not overdoing it. They move from, they don't even know mental wellness counseling exists to that they know. Now, how do we have them like us? Well, we, we provide content that has to do with our personality that helps them. How do they trust? Well, they really dive a little bit deeper. And that's where a, a call to action of going to some blog posts or some other things can be really helpful. Um, Sam, what do you think in regards to, in regards to that? Yeah, um, I think more likely than not, a blog post is adding value, um, unless obviously it's about a specific product offering or service offering. Um, so I would say, yeah, as long as you include in the description kind of what the blog post is about and how the ideal client's going to get value out of it, um, then I think getting them to click through, it's still adding value. It's not kind of tricking them to get to your website for an ulter ulterior motive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think Nathan, he has some questions and raised a point. And I think his question said, but didn't you do that with your affair quiz, Joe? Which I think he was referring to kind of the fear-based thing. Um, I, I do think that I did add some fear to it. But I also, when we look at the stats, I, I believe that the way that I promoted it when I was trying that for a few weeks, that the, the quiz was trying to add value and get people to really think differently about it. It did have some shock value there that some people could have seen as being slimy. Um, which I wanted to test it out and see how well people kind of noticed it. And um, so those of you that don't know, I use the Gottman's. They have a quiz that kind of walks you through how close or likely are you to have an affair. And so I had created a quiz for Facebook that kind of walks people through that. And because it was based on sound science uh, and it did kind of make it stand out a little bit, I can totally see how it could be perceived as using that fear-based thing. Um, but that's a great question. And I wanted to make sure I addressed that. Also another question with group practices, would you recommend or is it possible to have sub pages? Um, so I would say uh, having sub pages or multiple pages on Facebook would not be recommended. Uh, Sam, what do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. I think um, it can get confusing um, and also you kind of spread yourself too thin because then you have more pages to focus on as opposed to just one where you can make more of an impact. Yeah, I would be more apt to say if you have multiple specialties in a group practice, view the Facebook page as being kind of the hub of that that have kind of multiple arms. And so maybe you have Family Friday and you have Couples Wednesday and like have different themes throughout it if you have a lot of people. And then also look at other social media as focusing in specifically on other groups. So we know that 80% of users on Pinterest are female and half of those users are moms. And so if you're focusing in on either of those demographics, then you're going to want to have a Pinterest kind of presence there. And maybe you have a few boards that have a few different strategies. Uh, but when you're, when you're looking at Facebook, I'd say you want to keep that whole brand under one, one arena uh, rather than have multiple brands. Um, so we have some people heading out early because they have new clients. Congratulations to the new clients. Uh, Jonathan asks, is there a ratio for uh, how often a Facebook post should have a call to action? Uh, is call to action synonymous with promoting services? That's a great question, Jonathan. Uh, I'll kind of answer some of that, and Sam, you can jump in too. Um, I would say call to action is anytime you're asking someone to do something. So a call to action could be sign up for our email list and get our five tips for anger management. It could be read this blog post. It could be go to our page and watch this video. Usually it's taking people from all of social media and putting them into your funnel. Uh, a call to action wouldn't be sending them to Huffington Post. That would just be promotional activities for Huffington Post. You're just giving good content. So a call to action is promoting anything you do. Promoting services would be part of one of those. So it may be a direct call to action for you to sign up for counseling or to schedule an intake call or to you know, do an exploratory call, or maybe you might have some event that you're putting on for couples. So that's, that's how I would kind of parse that out. Anything to add to that in regards to kind of the ratio there, Sam? Um, yeah, no, I pretty much think the same. I think um, like what, when I was talking about my ratio earlier, I was, saying promoting in terms of promoting your services i literally was talking about you know like an event that you're setting up or encouraging people to book an appointment with you um i would say that getting them to read a blog post is still added value yeah great 